Allah, there's no way that you created all of this intricate system for what? For no reason at all. For no purpose at all. <coughs> Subhanaka, glory is to you, Fatina Allah. Protect us from the punishment of the hellfire. That was a little bit of yesterday's summary. We move on today. And we answer some very, very delicate questions tonight. That this idea, number one, is what is the purpose? How can we live that purpose? And more importantly, I want to answer a very hassas question tonight. And that is that if Allah understands exactly what I'm going through, or what I'll go through, where I'll end up, then what is the purpose of this entire life? Why am I going through these emotions? It's like a game almost. Right? I didn't ask for any of this. I mentioned last night that sometimes we, you know, we ask or we end up saying these very bold statements, right? I never asked for all this. Didn't ask to be created, didn't ask to be brought in this world. This miserable dunya, one test after one test after one test. With every test now, either I pass or I fail. If I get enough fail, I end up in the hellfire. Hum fiha khalidun for eternity. Or if I squeeze by and I pass, I end up in heaven. All of this entire system is what something I never asked for to begin with. So when you don't ask for it, it comes your way, you become frustrated. You become almost angry towards Allah subhanahu You want that what? You want that freedom that we think of. Right? Imagine now having no religion, having no halal, no haram, no idea of Allah and ajal and punishment and reward. For 24 you can do whatever you want. You can wear what you want, you can eat what you want, you can love who you want. No one's going to ask you, there's no salat, there's no dhikr, there's no worry about backbiting. You can sit there, you can gossip about him and her until you're tired. That freedom tastes good. And we think for a moment, that's what I want. That haywani azadi, that animalistic freedom. I talked about last night that you do you, you only live once, do what you want to do, don't worry about accountability, somebody else, God. No, it's your life, you do what you want. Right? Make your nafs your God. Your nafs says this, you say, love back to that nafs. And that's what I that's what we think we want. I'm also in that boat. I also go through my moments of anxiety and stress, God knows I've been through my tests. But it's important that we kind of refocus. Okay. First of all, we have to understand this idea that the fact that we exist is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one. Let's change the mindset. Okay. Let's change the lens. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran, the very first verse of Surah Al Insan, says what? Hal ata ala insana insani hino minadda'a lam yakun shayman both. There came a moment, there came a time over the inside when we were nothing worth mentioning. It didn't exist. The trees were there, the plants were there, the angels were there, some of the animals were there even. They were all glorified as this, these amazing creations. We were nowhere to be found. We weren't created. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us existence, gave us wujud. Okay? Created us. And made us the highest realm of all creation. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ Surah Al-Israel says, We have honored the human being. وَحَمَّلْنَاهُمْ تِلْبَرِ وَالْبَحَرِ We gave that insan the ability to travel between the land and the sea. وَرَضَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَا طَيِّبَاتِ We gave from the pure طَيِّبَاتِ the rest of this human being. وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرَ مِمَّا خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا We gave distinction, please follow me. Fadilat, distinction, بَلْتَرِي, بُلَنْدِي, عَضَبَتْ We gave greatness to the insan to the point where it was greater than every other great creation out there. Meaning what? You take the greatest animal, the greatest plant, the greatest tree, the greatest rock, the greatest angel, you put all line them up, the greatest of the greatest of the greatest, and the inside is what? Other than all those creations. Allah says we did that. To the point where not only is that inside sajid, that inside is masjud as well. 
Meaning what? Not only does that inside prostrate to me, but I've made other existences prostrate to the other inside as well. That's how much fire and pride I had in this inside. Now, as you know, the angels of the Bhagavad talk about this notion. Right? When Allah introduces in the late 20s of the verses, talks about the idea that I want to give this khalifa. <coughs> The angels were confused. Allah says the angels were not angry. Sometimes we present these verses from the member like the angels were angry, or the angels were confronting God out of the middle, or challenging God. That God, why would you? How could you? How dare you create this insan who's good for nothing? Fitna, fasad, husun, malizi, corruption, disruption, bloodshed. If you want someone to praise you, where are you praise you? We'll do your humbling for that. We'll praise you. But those don't create this inside. Sometimes that's presented as the insan being what? Being angry with Allah. Questioning God's wisdom. But no, Allah says no, it's not the case. They were confused. They were confused. What was that confusion? A very legitimate confusion. The confusion was that if Allah wanted to make us his khalifa and he did it, how is that going to happen? The angels were confused. Now here you have this being called Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's unlimited. He's valid. He's infallible. He's perfect. He's everything. He's metaphysical. You want this limited human being, who's limited, who's fallible, who's physical in nature, to somehow represent Allah. It's that disconnect. It's like a CEO who goes away for six months and ten months a year on some leave and says, okay, I've made the junior uh, entry-level guy in charge while I'm gone. You're like, what? How can he run the company? He doesn't have the qualities. And the moment they did that, Allah now, subhanahu wa ta'ala, before you ever even created, says, I know what you don't know. The first of all, you know, Mashallah, very, very, very well. I know what you don't know. Meaning what? There's a potential, there's a Joel Hunter, there's a jewel inside of this human being that you're not aware of. That if this Imzan taps into this jewel, he can very much, or she can very much be my Khalifa. So he gave us existence and made us respected amongst all the other creations. Called us what? The Ashraf al Makhlukah, the best of my creation. You have a poet, you have a painter, you have an artist, you have, I don't know, uh, whatever, you, you want a storyteller or an author, and they have a collection of everything that they've written, or they've sculpted, or they've painted, or they've published, but they always have that one piece that they're very, very proud of. This was my best paint, uh, my, my, my best drawing. This was my best poem. This was my best book. This was, I don't know, my best lyrics, for example. And they're always proud of that. And with pride, now they recite that. With pride, they show their heart of peace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was very proud of the way the Quran captures that moment of the fact that He created you and I. Okay. All of that distinction, all of that greatness, all of that, all those accolades and recognition, and now someone like me sits there and questions says, God, how could you, why did you break me? Why did you break me? Did you ask me for permission before you created me? Did you get my approval? Did I sign on the dotted line? Yes, you may create me. How could you do that? Why would you do that? Like someone comes to your front door, all the very simple example. Someone comes to your front door, drops off a beautiful gift for you without you even asking for it. Not your birthday, not your anniversary, nothing. I thought about you, here it is, it's, it's a gift which is a very, very monumental, a very expensive, a very beautiful gift. And you can't believe it. And you wonder why this person gave me this gift. You don't call them up and say, how dare you give me that gift? Who do you think you are to give me that gift? Did you ask me before you went shopping for me? And thought about me? And was considered towards me? You gave me this gift, the one I was going to accept it? So it doesn't make sense logically. Now yes, you'll argue with me that Allah is fine, but the gift that Allah has given us in this life is filled with hardships and trials and tribulations. Again. So here I gave you a cat as a gift, 
And that cat, mashallah, has been my headache since day number one. Here I give you, let's say, these canaries. And oh my god, it's very difficult to clean their cage and fill their water and buy this and buy that. Just come and take the canaries back, please. You gave me this life in this world, but it's been hard since day number one. How do we tackle that issue? So I, I, I'll take the fact that Allah put me into existence, but nobody in this room, I don't think anybody with a sound upward intellect will ever choose non existence over existence. If the choice tomorrow was to wake up tomorrow or not wake up tomorrow, I think everybody, no matter how much you're drowning in your ocean of life, would never choose not to wake up tomorrow. I like to believe that at least. So we know that existence over non-existence is preferred, it's a gift, we are thankful for that gift. We just don't want the hardship that's attached to it. It's a different discussion I'll take. that show tomorrow, I'll talk a little bit about that. But initially let's understand that there was a moment where us, the inside, we were not even anything worth mentioning. Nobody knew who we were. Allah came and gave us fadilat, distinction. That's point number one. Point number two is that we know. I have not created the jinn or man except that he or she worships me, recognizes me. Has ma'arifat of me. Okay. So that much we know. We know that my purpose and hadaf is Allah. That much I get. Okay. Now I'll give you the example. I was talking this morning to my host, and the same example I use with her, I'll use, I'll use with, 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 with all of you as well. Salam ala Muhammad. Allahumma salam Muhammad. You are going to leave for, let's say, a function at someone's house or some, let's say, building. Okay? And the host of that party gives you the address. Do you get it? Address. And you open up your Google Maps app, you open the app, and you put in that address in the destination. If there are multiple routes to that destination, the Google Maps app will give you all those routes and ask you to choose one. Okay. So you choose one. And you're driving a lot. Halfway through that destination, halfway through that journey, you make a left instead of making a right. What does it do? Reroutes and such. Rerouting, dot, 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 dot. Rerouting. It's, it is now becomes obsessively uh, Concerned with trying to get you back on that track. So go up, make a right, make a left, make a right, make a left, you're back on the track. It'll add two more minutes to your estimated run. It'll keep doing that. You can make 18 mistakes. It will reroute every single time. They'll never say you are not capable of following me as an app. They won't say that. Because the destination has not changed. The route constantly changes. As the route constantly changes, it's a matter of the fact that even when we go off the path and make a left in life, or we should have made a right, the idea is to what? Reroute the life to get back towards the destination. The destination is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of you know that. That does not change. The problem sometimes is, and hopefully my sister are listening, the problem sometimes is that when we take the destination or the route to be the destination, so sometimes talking to our sisters, they end up taking motherhood, for example, motherhood to be the maqsad and destination. That all I was made for is to bear children and raise children and be pregnant. I have my kid, six months later, I'm pregnant again. Then I have my second kid, and a year later, I'm pregnant again. And for those five, six, eight, nine, ten years, I have four or five kids. And you end up thinking that's what I was created for. How many times have I heard, I, have I heard young sisters tell me that one, well, I'm just good to bear children. I'm just good to be pregnant. My husband likes it when I'm barefoot and pregnant all the time. That's what he wants from me. And you start to believe that. So you take the GPS destination, remove God, and you put what motherhood on there. Now the route becomes the destination. The wasila becomes the maqsa. And that is where chaos ensues, where depression ensues, where anxiety ensues, 
But a reality is no doubt. There's a lot of favilas to being a mother. All of you know. The maqam of a mother is way higher than us fathers. It's not even close to Islam. But that route of motherhood is just that it's a route to get to God. So I often tell my sisters that you weren't meant or created to have children. You weren't. The kids were meant to be a route towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes I see mothers who all of a sudden wear hijab because their daughters wear hijab. Or I see fathers who never come to the center bring their eight-year-old because the eight-year-old needs to be. Now the kid, whether they know it or not, that kid becomes what? That wasila towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many times have we seen that? We have to properly identify the destination and the routes. And we have multiple routes in our life. My brother and my sisters living a purpose-driven life is to leave the destination where it is and to use every route in our life to reroute ourselves back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With a 9 to 5 career job, a lot of my young guys work 14, 15 hour days, sometimes on weekends. They're sitting there in front of the laptop and they're constantly glued, even all the way to the center. They're working, they're working, they're working. They have to work, that's fine. The command is to find Allah in that laptop. You sit there and you play one hour with your children. I, I, I advise my young parents out there, even my older parents. If you're grandparents in the audience, one of the ways to bring kids close to you is to become a kid yourself. The prophet says, with children, become children. So now, if that means you're on the ground playing horsey, 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 you mean horsey, horsey, horsey. I'm the best horsey in my house. I really am. I carry both my kids at the, at the exact same time. And sometimes they smack my head to go faster. Okay, that's a good story altogether. And sometimes I'm on the ground and I am coloring with my kid. And my rahma will tell me, Baba, now it's time for you to go from blue to red, red to yellow, yellow to green. I said, okay, no problem. That one hour was everything to her. Okay, so that one hour is a route that can lead towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're watching a match, if you're playing cricket, let's say, if you're watching basketball, if you're watching the Jets play, for example, or whatever you want to do, that one hour with your boys, with your friends, you're having a three-hour party, a sporting event, it's not haram, man. You can actually find a lot in that. If you tell yourself, I'm doing it for what? For brotherhood and bonding. Living a purpose-driven life is to find a lot in everything that you do. That is very hard to do. Such that in every route of your life, Allah is plastered on that route. If you're on social media, that's a route towards Allah. If you're with your spouse alone, that's a route towards Allah. If you're at school with your classmates, non-Muslim classmates, non-Muslim classmates, that's a route towards Allah. If you're by yourself in your room at 1 o'clock in the morning, that's a route towards Allah. If you're here in the center, it's a route towards Allah. Everything has to be harmonized towards that one destination. And any time we slip, and we're about to slip, we'll make a right, we'll make a left, we'll make a U-turn, we have to constantly what? Reroute, reroute, reroute. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obsessed with the fact that He even let us hit the reset button sometimes. And start all over again. I get emails from people in their 30s, in their 40s. Can you prove God to me? In their 40s. This is them what? Restarting their entire life. Shutting down the phone and doing a hard reboot. A control all delete. Or holding down your phone, the home button, the power button, and doing a, a restart. And a lot is okay with that. Providing that what? You refocus your Google Maps app. Such that you put the right decision inside that app. Sallu ala Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Muhammad. It goes back to the idea of being conscious of everything that you're doing. Consciousness. Be present in the moment. The Prophet says to Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar, attach a niyat to everything that you do. Such that everyday mubah and mundane acts become worship of Allah. From putting your clothes on to sleeping, to, I don't know, eating a banana, to putting on your shoes, to grabbing a coffee and Tim's, whatever the case may be, everything becomes Allah when you attach a near. Attach an attention is being conscious, mindful of what you're doing. Not somebody who just is living their life like, you know, 
without any purpose or hope. You kind of wander through it from here, from there, from there. What's the point of all this? Is there really a point to all this? I have people who have a tough time getting out of bed in the morning. When you say, let's go, let's make the bed, let's change your clothes, they'll say, for what reason? What's the point of getting out of bed? Right? That's a person who is defeated. Because they think that they're simply, they're simply carrying out this play by Allah, or game, not all the Allah, that's been used sometimes, by Allah, that we are just kind of pawns in the game of, uh, of life of Allah, that Allah now has created. And sitting there watching us go from here to here, and he knows full well that we'll end up at the station at the end, but he'll sit there and watch us struggle, let's say, for example. And I really want to change that mentality tonight. So do I, Muhammad. So, inshallah, that discussion about why was I created is somewhat clear. It requires, of course, more discussion, but that's clear. Let's come to the very important is, uh, question. That if Allah knows everything, why am I carrying out these everyday acts? First of all, let's understand. Everything we do is not for Allah. Meaning what? Everything that we do does not help or hurt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not that if, uh, if tomorrow I decide to God forbid leave the deen, that Allah's, Allah's kingdom will become a little bit less powerful. Or if all of us decide to become really super pious tomorrow, that His kingdom becomes a little bit stronger. I'm sorry. Let's get that out of our minds. Everything He's asked us to do or to avoid is for us and us alone. Has no effect on his kingdom. Okay. The very first opening discussion in Khutbah al Hamam of Imam Ali alayhi salatu When Hamam comes to the Imam Ali, says, Mola, describe to me who the pious ones are. And Imam Ali gives him a very generic verse of the Quran to kind of you know, let him go. And he says, No, I want more. And then the Khutbah begins. Initially, Imam Ali says that everything that's come down for, 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 from Allah is for us, not for him. He's Azal, he's Abad. He was there from day number one, he'll be there after we're long gone. It does not require you and I to be strength, or to be strong, or to be weak. If that's the case, then everything that we do is for our own developments. Okay? Does Allah know everything? Of course not. Does he know where they end up? Yes, he does. Does he know the mistakes we make? Yes, he does. Absolutely. He's Adil, he's all known. Nothing the Lord doesn't know. But what he knows and what we know are independent of each other. And what he knows, he does not come and interfere in our life. Please understand. The common argument is that if Allah knows everything what I'll do, where is this idea of free will? Well, cool. the free will idea is that we're choosing our own decisions. Independent of Allah. Allah knows everything about us, but we don't know what Allah knows about us. Do we? And then gets a text message from Allah, what uh, about today? An email from Allah? A WhatsApp group, God and me? No. Anybody here? No, no one does. We have no idea. What we know and what Allah, Allah knows are completely independent. So our decisions that we make in our life have no influence by what Allah knows. He does not come and influence us. He suggests to us, He inspires us, He places elements of Hidayah to us, but ultimately to travel that path is up to us. I gave you the path, I showed you the path, it's up to you now. You can be a coffin or a shakir, you can accept that path, you can avoid that path. The ultimate choice is yours. But you will be held, we will be held accountable for that choice. But of course Allah knows what will end up. But we don't know what will end up. So every little moment that we have in our life is for our own development. Understand this for a moment. Look, that means Musa is running from Fir'aun. He gets to the, to, uh, to, to, to the water. He's commanded by Allah to strike his staff onto the ground. Correct? Then what happens? The water opens up. Take it. And he walks right to the water. Two massive walls of water in between the path. Him and the, the Bani Sahir walk to the path. Walk to the water. 
Amazing story, very, very well known. Why? Why did Allah need Nabi Musa to hit the staff? Was that something that Allah needed? I mean, if the staff was not strong on the ground, did it require Allah to also I can't do it because you didn't strike your staff? No. He's telling us that, look, you do whatever you can do. In your capability, I will do the rest. But you first do what's in your limitation. Your striking of the staff triggered my marches. If that didn't happen, it wouldn't happen. That's what you can do, that's what I can do. But Nabi Musa had no idea that if I strike the staff, now the water will split. Nor did Allah tell him, tell him himself that even if you don't strike the staff, I will split the water. No. You striking the staff and then you split the water are completely connected. You do what you can do, I will do what I can do. Independent of each other. Because he wanted to what? He wanted to sit there and nurture and nourish and allow to flourish Nabi Musa. Look, the devil gave you a plant, a plant. You bring a plant from the, from the store, it's a small little plant. Okay, and you decide based on the plant, is it an outdoor plant, indoor plant, by the window, or away from the window, a lot of water, little water. There are some plants that require growth from water once a week. There are those that have to be constantly watered, <coughs> drenched almost, to grow. It's up to you to give that plant all the necessary tools to grow. But the growing comes from the plant. Not gonna grab leaves and stretch the leaves on you. No, you're not. Not gonna grab the stem and, and do this. No, you're not. You give them water, you give it sun, you watch it every single day, and you watch it grow. It'll take the elements and it'll grow by itself. That growing by itself is the ikhtiyar of the plants. Is the free will of the plants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts every element of the diet around us. Everything around us, from our parents to the ulama to the Quran, to our own aqal, to everything. To Muharram, to Azadari, to the Ahlul Bayt, there are so many, all these avenues to grow. The actual growth must come from within. That's where the free will happens, to choose to tread the path. And that's what Allah wants. Allah wants us to discover ourselves. Understand my point right now. To discover ourselves. Ilm in nafs, to know yourself is one of the most adim ulama ilm out there. The most respected knowledge out there is for you to know yourself. It sounds fluffy, I know. It sounds very Dr. Phil like, right? To know yourself, know thyself. But the reality is that we don't know ourselves. Sometimes we are confronted with a very difficult tragedy or hardship or struggle, and we, we, we convince ourselves, I will never get through this hardship. I get to the hardship, and the first person who's most who's the most surprised is me. It's me. And later on we tell ourselves, I cannot believe I got through that hardship. And that hardship Allah placed in front of you? Absolutely. Did he know you survived? Absolutely. But you didn't know you would survive. And he wanted to show you that you could survive this storm. His knowledge is independent from you. His knowledge does not interfere with your free will and choices. He's just like, he says, look, I will inspire you, I'll whisper to you, but you have to ultimately now choose the right path. <laughs> if you show taqwa, if you show God consciousness, I will give for you a makhraj, an outlet, a solution to your problems. And I'll give you risk from a source that you never even accounted for. But the condition is strike the staff, take the first step, show that level of piety, challenge yourself to not go down the road of shaitan. Once you do that, then I'll begin to shower you. But you have to do that from your own free will. Sallallahu <laughs> Now remember, we don't identify ourselves sometimes until the boat is rocked. I'll give you a very simple example. I have a very simple example, I'm sorry. I'm not a big philosopher, or, you know, I can barely read. We, you know, I, I, I give the example of, 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 the, of, of our camps in Toronto, in our community on Mahdi. We uh, take our youth every single year to an annual camp. This year we took our kids, about 85 of them, up north four hours on an island. We spent five days, four nights there. Myself and two of the ulama, we had, you know, we had discussions and classes and sports and volleyball.
basketball and cricket and, and canoeing and private swimming for the girls and for the boys and you know campfires and bonfires and the whole night. And uh, I remember the first day that we arrived around this whole time, this young guy comes to me and says, Asadhai, I can't wait to show you my flashlight. It's the sickest flashlight I've ever seen. Before. It's so epic. All these Greek words that you guys use, right? It's epic. I said, really? I said, yeah, I can't show you now because it's light outside. But make sure after Mother Misha, you come and you find me. I'll show you how amazing my flashlight is. So after Mother Misha, we tell our kids, look, make sure that when you come from your cabins, grab your hoodies, it's really cold, grab your flashlights. From the from the from the, 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 the monster all to the campfire, it's completely pitch black. You can't see anything. So that first time I remember the shot is done, now we're on our way out, and, and right outside the prayer hall I see this 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 youth. And he has this flash in his hand. And he goes, come with me, I said, okay. And he turns on the flashlight. And it was a sick flashlight. It really was a sick flashlight. It must have lit up half of the island. Massive, massive amount of light that went for miles. See, I told you it's a sick flash. Yeah, that's a sick flash. And I wasn't able to truly appreciate the flashlight until it was dark around us. That's when I knew how beautiful the light was that he had. That's how knew how. That's how I knew how far the light would go. Only in darkness. If he was to light that flashlight at, at, at breakfast time, it wouldn't have the same effect. We're no different, my brothers and my sisters, we're no different. What Allah wishes to, 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 to tell us is that sometimes how bright our flashlight is inside of us. That only happens when we're surrounded by darkness. When we're surrounded by anxiety and stress. When we're depressed, and when we're drowning in our own sadness, when we're sinking in our own quicksand. Then when you light the flashlight, it's like, whoa, I didn't know I had this light with me the entire time. But it took the darkness to show you the power of the lights. You cannot see that power of the flashlight when it's bright outside. Beautiful weather outside. Not one cloud in the sky outside. The flashlight will make no sense whatsoever. It takes that darkness for you to pull out that light inside of you. To show yourself, forget anybody else, how much I have inside of me. When Imam Ali alayhi salatu wa salam, Allah Allah, Muhammad wa alayhi wa can you please give me a nice salat, please, Allah Muhammad wa alayhi wa salam. Allah Muhammad wa alayhi wa salam. The very famous tradition about the alim and akbar inside of you. We take these words for granted, I think, sometimes. Profound words. You think that you are a Mahmoudi existence. You think that you are an ordinary existence when a grand universe is inside of you. I remember, specifically remember, the, the first morning of the Friday of sunrise, at that very same camp, there was a dock, and there was water until you know, they say, how did you see the water, right? So like, as far as the eyes can see, we saw water. We saw water. And on that dock, we read the right about sunrise. Okay? It was beautiful. What a moment. And I remember sitting, standing beside a 16 year old, first time he was at camp, he said, I said, hey, look how huge this water is. Whatever I see, I see water. I'm just so amazed by the water. I feel so small in front of this water. And I wish at that moment I told him, this water is nothing compared to what's inside of you. <laughs> nothing compared to what's inside of you. It pales in, in, in comparison. The universe inside of you. Imam Ali says the sickness, the cure, all that is what is inside of you. It's a matter of you looking not outside of you, but turning the focus inside of you to find that universe inside of you. It's such a paradox, right? When you talk about the galaxies and the galaxies, I talked about last night, the galaxies, think about little old me on Earth in the Milky Way of a million galaxies, you can't, you, I'm not even a dot on the paper. I feel completely insignificant. But within me, there's a universe in my life. There's an entire universe inside of me. So while I am a dot when it comes to everything else, when it comes to, to me, I am this grand universe. 
It's a matter of us understanding that universe that happens when you live a purpose-driven life. Such that even through your quicksand, through your storm, through your anxiety, depression, and grief, you still don't lose sight of that GPS destination. You know, the, the, the Quran captures these moments. I tell you, I came across these verses recently that I really hope my sisters understand this point. One point I want to make to them. Salam alaikum. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Surah Maryam talks about, of course, the birth of Nabi Isa and the mother of uh, Nabi Isa, Bibi Maryam, one of the four great women in Islam, of course. And it captures the moment where she was about to give birth to Nabi Isa. Okay? And the pain of of a pregnancy reaches a point where she finds herself at the, at, at the bank of a tree about to deliver. That pain is excruciating. Only women can understand that pain. We can't. At that moment, a sentence comes out of her mouth, which really floored me. Floored me. And the Quran captures this sentence. She says, Ya laytani mittu O oh, woe unto me, O oh, woe unto me, if only I had died before this happened. You know, sometimes I hear stories from the delivery room. That when those contractions and when that delivery is happening, the pain is so excruciating that sometimes our sisters describe it to me the fact that I saw death right in front of me. Now, if in that moment, please, I want you to imagine for a moment, please follow me. If in that moment, this woman inside the delivery room is to scream out, I wish I was dead while she's delivering a child, you and I might think, oh, she's just being ungrateful. What a beautiful moment of creation and existence and life and this beautiful muscle child's coming out of her and she's asking for her own death. You think, oh, blasphemy and how could you and these are not things and worry about the great ass and what the boy will go say like this, blah, 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 be grateful, blah, blah. But here's me being money. Saying, I wish, I wish, before this, I was dead. And the fact that she said that is one thing. The fact that Allah chose to make that one of the 6,000 plus verses is another thing altogether. To make things relatable, to tell you these things are not there to destroy your hadaf and purpose. You think at that moment she lost God? No, of course not. It's a natural emotion to feel. That's the pain that you and I as men cannot understand. But she always had that purpose in mind. So sometimes I think that we're a little bit too hard on ourselves. Hard on ourselves. And we have to always reroute and be, you know, be fair to yourself. You know, there's two mistakes that we make. And I end with my side, it's already been 45 minutes. Two mistakes that we make. The first mistake that we make, that I make, someone like me makes, is the fact that I am sometimes too easy on myself. Keegan, I forgive myself way too easy. I justify everything that I do by the fact that 10 people who are worse than me do 10 good things that are way worse than I do. So at least I don't do that more. And that sentence alone now wipes out every sin that I do and makes it so that's not like I am the best of the best. I'm not this bad or that bad or that bad. And that's a mistake, of course. Right? We minimize our, the, the, the sin in our eyes, that same sin is maximized in the eyes of Allah. Imam Ali's very beautiful statement. We minimize, he maximizes. <laughs> the other mistake that we make is that we never forgive ourselves. We think for a moment that that, that, that mistake that I made when I was 16, 15 years old, in high school, in public school, and now when I'm 48 years old, right, some 33 years later, for example, there's no way that God will ever forgive me for the mistake I made 33 years ago. So I'm a hopeless case, Mulana, so I might as well make this dunya my heaven. How many times have I heard? Young guys come to me, 21 year olds come to me and say, I know for sure that I am down for the hellfire, so I decided to make this dunya my heaven. Okay, mashallah. That's satanic in nature. That's shaitan who's whispering inside of you. But we make two mistakes. That's why the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says the, the last person you should refer to 
in your own self-development is you. Oh, <laughs> what a beautiful truth. The last person you should refer to in measuring your own self-development, your chutzazi, your self-building, is you. You're not a good judge of character for yourself. Either you are way too easy on yourself or you're way too hard on yourself. So when it comes to the idea of us refocusing towards Allah, we rallying towards Allah, sometimes within every little mistake that I make, every moment of anxiety or stress or grief or sadness is blasphemy. We think stress equals kufr, anxiety equals kufr, sadness equals kufr. A true mu'min is never stressed. A true mu'min is never anxious. A true mu'min never grieves. Talk of Allah, sister, please. Rely on, uh, rely on Allah, brother, please. Don't go out of your element and you think, wow, not only am I not, I can't grieve, but now I'm guilty for grieving. So this double whammy now comes on top of me. And we're trying to find our route back to Allah. Somehow trying to find God in the death of my father, or my sister, or my spouse, or my young 12 year old child. How do I find God in that? Well, the moment I shed one tear, people say, oh, no, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. It's God's will, it's God's will. Don't cry, the soul is upset right now. You're making the soul unhappy by crying. And now you think you're a horrible person because you didn't grieve properly for your 12 year old, or your husband, or your wife, who died of cancer. You know, the prophet, what? The prophet now labels one year Allah or Hussein, the year of grief. When he lost his wife, he lost, he lost his biggest support. These are small things, my brothers and sisters. When we are, when we are living a purpose-driven life, we have to keep that maqsa there and reroute ourselves to Allah, but do it in a fairness way. A way. Allow yourself to be human sometimes. Allow yourself not to know that even if I fall or trip, I'll make my way back to Allah. Allah will be there to always answer my call. Ujibu da'wati da'an ila da'an, he says. I will answer the call of the caller whenever they call. Whatever they call. Six months after, six years after. If they decide to call me after six years of ignoring me, I will answer that, that, that call. All of this is for our development. Allah knows that you will get to that point and be that I know that I that you'll get to. He knows that, but He wants you to, to discover yourself in the process, and then enjoy the benefits of the hereafter in the hereafter. If all of you attain Jannah, inshallah, you will you attain Jannah. That pleasure you feel, you feel, not Allah. Everything we do is for ourselves. Every reward that we uh, we we we, uh, we reach is for ourselves. It's not for Allah. Allah is not there benefiting from our 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 uh, our good good deeds and you know crying over our bad deeds. Everything is for ourselves. And so while He knows everything, we don't know everything. And He wishes now for us to discover ourselves in the process of getting to that destination that's known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. It's the night of the seventh of Safar. And I want to remind we have that tonight is the shahadat of our second Imam. Imam Hassan al-Mushtabah alayhi salatu wa salam. And I just want to spend a few minutes in remembering this Imam, although the other line is a Thai sufferer, 20th sufferer, which I think the majority of the Pakistani community can commemorate. But it's good to at least, you know, because a lot of the uh, communities in the world, they commemorate this day to be the day of the of Imam Hassan. I talked about generosity yesterday, if all of you remember. I said, Sakhawa is that individual, or Sakhi is that individual who gives before someone asks for it. And maybe there isn't a better manifestation or tajalli of that in our second imam. His Sakhawa, his generosity, him being Jawad, is well known in history. Three times in his life he gave away half of his wealth to those who were in need. His sitting with and associate with the poor of Medina was very well known to the point where the ashab of this Imam would complain to him. 
This is not a nasib for you. You're the Imam of the time, the Khalifa of the time. It's not appropriate for you to sit with people in, in, in this class of society. But he would often say that I find I find contentment with this group. He would invite him over, and he of course would invite them over. And this dastakhar, this sufra, the Allah sometimes we have in our communities, stems from this moment of generosity of our second. But the reality is that his shahadat and the way that he was shaheed is heartbreaking. You know, we hear about the fact that 10 of the 11 imams that were shaheed were poisoned. You know, the Imam Ali that was struck with the sword, it was the poison of that sword that killed him. And we hear that and we kind of, you know, at least I do, we kind of move on. I don't think we quite understand the poison that was used by the enemies back then. It's such that if the poison was to drop on a patch of grass, the grass would be seconds would erode and die. It would destroy anything around it. Now imagine that poison to be inside of you. There were certain poison that were used by the money, the way the money process that was slowly killing the animals. It only took three days for that poison to kill. Then there were moments where that poison would enter your system and begin to destroy your organs within them. Imam Mustafa was poisoned by his wife, as all of you know, to the point where he would throw up pieces of his inner liver. It's very painful. And there comes a moment where Imam Hussein is sitting with our second Imam. He sees a situation where he becomes sick and ill and in a lot of pain. And he begins to cry for him. He begins to grieve. And the second Imam now forgets his own pain and tells his brother to please don't cry. You'll have your day as well, La Yomaka. There's no day like your day. <clears throat> I'm leaving this world and you're sitting beside me consoling me. I'm leaving this world and my sister Zainab is consoling me. I'm leaving this world and my ashab are around me supporting me. But there'll come a moment where you will be Kharib and Tanha and alone on the plains of Karim. I'll be poisoned, and that poison will kill me, no doubt. But I'll be buried by my companions, buried by my family. I'll be given a husr, wrapped in a fun. I'll be buried properly. Yes, we have a wire somewhere that said that his mayyat was disrespected amongst us. But ultimately, he was able now to get his burial right fulfilled by those around him. You know, sometimes I hear about these moments in history. Second of Bahar and Imam Hussein arrives in Karbala, right? His horse does not stop in this northern part of Iraq. Some of the Ma'at say that they changed the horse seven times and the horse would move. And then finally he asked the Bani Asad, does this place have a name to it? And you've heard the Masai, right? Naynama Shakur Farat. When Bazook said that our Ajdad, our four of Allah, used to say, call it his Karbala. And he would command Abu Fala to pitch up the tents and set up all the women and children. This is where we will shed our own blood. And then he does something very ajeeb, Imam Hussein does. He calls the money of some child. First, he calls the men. He says, Look, there's going to be a battle here. There's going to be a war. We're going to fight. Our bodies will be killed, mutilated, trampled, disrespected. If you can, please give us our burial rights. Bear us. And then he even went one step further to put up a partition, Imam Hussein, and speak to the women of the Bani Asr tribe. And say, if your men are not able to bear.